Oogie. 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 I taste earthquake whiskey cherries. Jason Armsworth. Awesome intro song. All right, in case you guys are wondering what the tune is, um, that's from Epic Sound. It's a subscription site. You can get one month for free. They're not a sponsor. Um, so if you're looking for background music for videos uh, that's copyright free and there's a gazillion genre, styles, moods, beats, uh, just check out Epic Sound first month for free. Uh, you can download a ton of stuff for free for a month and then it's like, I don't know, two or three dollars a month. Um, so that's where that came from. So I just downloaded a bunch of uh, heavy metal tunes for it, but that, that, if you're wondering about my background music from our more recent videos, uh, that's what it's coming from. Um, uh, Kevin Mayotto, thank you very much for uh, tuning in. So, gentlemen and ladies, if there happen to be in the house, either watching on the replay or live, um, I'm shifting. I used to do Wednesdays, moving to Fridays. Um, used to come before Jason at uh, Mash and Drum. Because of my work schedule and now exercise schedule, uh, I'm finding Fridays just works really well. I don't have to be as much in a hurry to get through the gym to then take a shower and tend to maybe get something to eat and then do the video, you know. So it just works out really, really well. I'm kind of relaxed. I don't have to worry about getting up in the morning. I'm also focusing Fridays as being more of an opportunity to bring on guests, get to know uh, more people in the uh, whiskey tuber community. Um, and then Sundays, of course, is my whiskey church. Um, and that'll that'll keep going. Um, all right. So um my guest this evening is Vito from Cask Strength. I first saw Vito on uh Whiskey in the Six, Rob's uh channel, and immediately subscribed as I was watching him. And I thought, well, there's someone I want to get to know, um, and it'd be great to have him on. Um there are some really, really big channels people I've become friends with, but I want to get to know sort of a broader base and get to know some of the up and coming channels. In fact, uh, Cask Strength is on the verge of hitting 500 and subscribers. And this channel, I have two channels. Um, this My channel is on the verge of hitting 600 subscribers. My wine channel, I have a wine side channel, it passed 3,000 uh, a little while back. Um, so anyway, but we're talking about whiskey. All right. So hey, Vito, say hello to everybody in the house. What's going on, guys? <laughs> so, um, so let's see. Uh, Mike. Now there's going to be probably some new people here, people who know Vito more than they do me. Um, but that's great. I want to get to know some. But Kenneth Kelty, thank you very much for uh, tuning in. Kevin Mayado, thank you very much for uh, tuning in. Currently have uh, seven people watching. All right. So. Um, tonight we're both doing Ugudo. We're both had Ugudo before, Ardbeg Ugudo. Uh, this is a cask strength, uh, bottle 54.2% alcohol by volume. Um, if you're not familiar with it, so last week I had Jason C from Mash and Drum. We did Koivrekin. Koivrekin is a turbulent, um, water condition that sometimes happens in the water nearby, uh, Ardbeg. This is named after the Lock, Lock Ugudo, their water source. Uh, that they think have provide something unique to their whiskeys. They say they get a little bit of peatiness off the water itself, but that's debatable, but I won't get into that. All righty. So, hey, Vito, um, I really want to get to know you. I've been watching a lot of your videos, 
And I noticed, I watched your top five video uh, that all of them were peated with the exception of the Eleanor. Talk yes. a little bit about that. You're, a, you're much of a peat head. Uh, yeah. So that was my sort of introduction to, uh, to whiskey was uh, peated scotches. I was never really big into whiskey. Um, it was mostly like, you know, as a young, young, younger guy, you're just shooting J Jack Daniels and, you know, just using it to, you know, have a good time. And then I made a trip to Scotland. And when I was in at the Isle of Skye in, um, up, up in the Hebrides, Hebrides, I think it's Heb Hebrides. But yeah, I was, I was up there and I asked a bartender for something local. He poured me some, uh, Talisker 10 and that kind of started the whole, the whole love of it. It was that, that slightly briny peatiness. And then a couple months later, I tried a uh, Lafroy Corda cask and immediately fell in love. It was the high, well, it's a super, super peated scotch, right? So it, it was, it kind of blew Talisker 10 out of the water for me in terms of my enjoyment of it. And that kind of just opened up the floodgates, to, like that smoky characteristic uh, of Isla's. So um, I just, I fell in love. I still, and it, it was hard because you have to work backwards when you started off with something so intense. Right. Right. So it was, it was, you know, the normal. You're starting off with heavy metal and you're going to wake your way down to, um, you know, classical music. Exactly. It was, it was, it was. <laughs> You're you're kind of branded a lunatic when you when you start off that strong and then have to work your way back, but it was interesting. Um, and I over the, and this was pretty much the first full year of me drinking whiskey, so it was the majority was all peated because that's the even on my shelf that's the majority of what I have. Um, that's what I like to buy mo more of than than others. And um, I had to throw in the Eleanor there. As, I enjoy it, but it has, it means so much more than just the whiskey being good, that one there. So I felt it necessary to include that one. Right. Yeah. I totally, yeah, I totally know what you felt by that because so in my top 10 for the year, um, some of the, my favorites or made my top 10 were gifts. There were samples I got from uh, Scotch for Dummies and it was the context or, or even the Elijah Craig Barrel Proof. The first time I had it, the context was at the Scotch test them his fifth anniversary. So it wasn't just the whiskey, although it was definitely that too. Yeah. But it was the context in which you get it and the, and the memories that are tied to it and the emotional re response to it uh, in terms of having a good time with friends as well as the whiskey itself. Yeah. Roy, Roy has a good, um, a good thing that he kind of brought, brought to, uh, I'm sure for mo the, a lot of people's attention was uh, uh, there are no strangers in whiskey. And uh I first heard him say that when I met him in Austin, Texas, and uh, it kind of it's kind of stuck with me. And I've met so many great people through whiskey, and the the personal aspect of whiskey at at this point of of, of my enjoying it has almost taken over the enjoyment of the whiskey. So it, on that note, I'm gonna say hi to a few more people who've popped in. Uh, so I, in fact, I, Jason's ears were probably burning because I mentioned just a second ago. Uh, Mash and drum, go Habs. Santa Cruz in my neighbor to the south. So I'm in the Silicon Valley. He's in Santa Cruz, which is on the other side of the Santa Cruz Mountains. Uh, whiskey wise, um, I'm guessing he's someone you may know. Yeah, he's um, Mitch Weddle. If you've seen him, he was on a couple of the um, um, the whiskey tribe chat uh, videos. He's a uh, level two sommelier, I believe. Okay. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about the whiskey because they're going to get upset if we just jibber jabber. Absolutely. Uh, and how we become friends. Drink a little bit of whiskey. We shall. Cheers, sir. Cheers. Swange. So what is it about this one in particular you said you like? We talked before we went there. This is one of your favorites. This is. It was. It's the it's the interplay of the of the sweet sherry and the um, and the typical Ardbeg ashy, just peat forward flavor profile it just plays extremely well with each other and i kind of like and the way i sort of sometimes approach whiskey is how would i have how would i have felt about this had i not had other whiskeys before right if someone were to like describe this to me it being smoky and sweet would that intrigue me right so right. just just the that sort of interplay of those terms kind of makes me intrigued about the whiskey and kind of draws me more towards it. Then when I actually dive into the nose and the palate, it really kind of solidifies uh, the feelings that I, that the, the preconceived notions and feelings that I 
that I developed to enjoy it even more. And it definitely has the, the sort of, I would say, the classic um, Ardbeg savory notes as well. Some people mm -hmm. say bacon. Some people say you know cooked meats, whatever. That plays in with that 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 sweet that I, I just really really like. Yeah, it's almost like like a sweet barbecue on some pork, right? It's, um, I'm just, it, I'm, 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 I'm just sorry. I'm gonna say I'm a lot more impressed with it now than from my memory. I, I mentioned before we went live. You know, it's been a while since I've tasted this, so my memory faded a little bit. So I'm really you know, looking forward to this evening, getting back into it and refreshing my memory on it. But my bottle is right about halfway, which is probably about the sweet spot. And yeah. it really shows itself well versus a neck pour. But I'm saying, I'm like, from my memory, I like it a lot more now than from what I re initially recall. You still there? Sorry, you, you, sorry, you, you, uh, I had a little bit of a, of a freeze there. I have okay. missed it. My apologies. All right. Yeah, no worries. Um, we're uh, <laughs> we are going all the way from Canada to California. Um, so a lot of people know my background. So I, I got into wine in the late 19, 1990s, went to a restaurant, couldn't read a wine menu, thought, gee, I should learn a little bit about wine, went to out to the wine country, fell in love with the beauty of the wine country, made a mental note. I, I, I want to study wine more formally. I was working on my master's degree at the time. So years later, I went back to college, studied enology, winemaking, interned with three different wineries, um, and then went and got an advanced certification with the Wines for Educational Trust, then went and studied with three master sommeliers, became a certified sommelier, then became a French wine scholar at the Wine Scholar Guild. And then while studying for the WSET Wines for Educational Trust diploma, one of the units was on spirits, because I had zero interest in whiskey or spirits, that while studying for that exam, I got introduced to whiskey, and then all of a sudden, it was like, uh, it was if I was engaged to be married and I met another woman. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was on this track. I was on this track to become a master of wine. And then I met whiskey and I suddenly went a different direction, you know. Um, no regrets. And so I went to Scotland. I've been to Kentucky. I went to Scotland last June, visited 20 distilleries. Um, so what? tell me a little bit about your intro. Some people grew up with wine, like uh, Jason, you know, an Italian. He grew up with wine around the house. Um, tell me a little bit about your background. How'd you get into uh, whiskey? Uh, so my my ex girl, one of my ex girlfriends, her father was extremely into whiskey, and I uh, every time I would be over, he would uh, give me a small pour of whiskey. And being you know not rude, I would accept it. I didn't like whiskey, but I accepted it and I drank it. Kind of you know half half heartedly I would, but i would i would do it just as out of respect kind of thing um and then well, things happen we broke up and then when i was planning my uh my trip to europe a couple uh, a year and a bit ago to about two years now i decided i'm gonna go to scotland because i always heard how beautiful it is and and uh I, it kind of gave me an opportunity as well to maybe try whiskey there i liked I, I seem to have this 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 uh, aspiration to try things where they come from because the experience is completely different. If I don't like it, I find situ environment really plays a big part in in what my opinions are of something. So I figured I'm gonna go to Scotland and you know not only to enjoy the beauty of it and everything, but I'm gonna try some whiskeys, and that's where I tried the Talisker Ten for the first time. So you yeah. fell in love with whiskey in Scotland. For the most, yeah, pretty much. Wow, that's yeah. pretty cool. So Robert Parker, people may or may not, he is probably one of the top wine critics, at least here in the United States. Um, on his honeymoon back in the nineteen sixties, he went to France on his honeymoon and fell in love with wine on his honeymoon in France. Okay, which is and when that's like the mecca of wine. Comes back to the United States, he's a big time lawyer, and he starts this little thing called the Wine Advocate. Which then later gave birth to the whiskey advocate. Nice. Uh, he he's also the one who came up with the hundred point score for the wine world. The UK was using the twenty point score, and then the hundred point score that frame made its way over to wine enthusiasts, wine spectator, and so on and so forth. So he didn't go to France to fall in love with wine. He he just happened to run into it. Of all the places in the world you could be and, and fall in love with wine, he was in the place to be. 
And same thing for you. For, of all the places in the world you could be to fall in love with whiskey, you were in the place to be to fall in love with whiskey. That's pretty yeah, cool. Yeah, I, I was pretty fortunate uh, that I, I, I decided to go to Scotland and I happened to, the first whiskey that I had in Scotland was up, I was in Broadford in uh, about 45 minutes south of Portree on the Isle of Skye in a in a, like a the only open bar at nine o'clock in the in the evening in town and i just went to the bartender you know can i have a pour of, of you know a local whiskey and he took out a talisker tent and gave me about a three four ounce pour <laughs> and uh yeah it was pretty that was pretty much the the ignition that uh that started all of this wow, for that's me. Pretty cool so had you been so that was what say would you say it was a year ago or two years ago or that was in 20 Oh, well, 2017. Okay. Yeah. So have you been back since then? I have not, uh, um, regrettably. I do have plans to try and get out to Isla at some point this year, um, but that's kind of in the works still. So, right. yeah. So, when I, yeah, there, so I went to, I was in the lowlands, I was in Isla, the highlands, and space side, and kind of went uh, a little bit of everywhere. And I'm going back next July uh, for another. From the prop, looking at July fourth through the twenty first, I won't go back to Isla until Ardenhoe opens up. Um, but I'll be in the Lowlands and High Islands of Spain, hopefully, hopefully making my way up to uh, Orkney. But yeah, it's it's really a magical place uh, to check out Isla. Yeah, I definitely want to want to try because I, I I I was in Edinburgh and I drove up to I drove up into Inverness, across over to Portree, and then back down through into Glasgow. Um, so I kind of want I want to go back and re and I was only there for f seven days um so it was kind of like a little bit more whirlwind especially with the with the driving and I was there alone too um so I, I really want to go back and you know spend more time uh exploring because it's it's, a, it's an absolutely gorgeous country so um I, I mentioned before before we went live I watched I've been watching all your uh, the short videos not the one hour live streams I, I might get around to watching those. By the way, anybody in the chat room, if you guys haven't subscribed to Cast Strength, highly recommend it. Uh, definitely check out his channel. So I definitely want to subscribe. Um, so your top five of the year, uh, four out of the five are peated, and then one was uh, Eleanor. So yep. do you do you have a preference? So like Scott and Bart, or Scott's test dummies, Bart's a big peat head. Scott's more on the sherry side, although he grew into peats. Do you do you think thus far you're more into the, the peated whiskeys? Myself, yeah. Well, see, yeah, I'll always, I'll always go to a peated whiskey when all else fails. Um, but because I'm st like, I don't consider myself uh, anything more than you know, um, like a like an enthusiast. So I will always try and um, uh, try whiskey. That doesn't matter what it is, I will try it, um, regardless of you know other people's opinions of it, or I will try it because you. You'll like it or not you can't always go by what people say um if you've grown to you know a specific you know over many many years you know i like sherry whiskeys i've tried peated whiskeys they're not my thing uh, i'm still super fresh so i'm trying to not um develop i'm trying to develop a, a, a wider scope of what i what i enjoy and um Unpeated scotches, Highland space size, lowlands. I love Akintosh and Three Wood. Um, bourbon is is has been my kind of point of of uh, of attention lately. Trying to kind of fight like you know the couple of normal tasting notes that you find and get you know a little more enjoyment out of it. Um, the, the heavy sweetness has always kind of deterred me a little bit, just because of my silliness in my early 20s and uh how i abused some bourbons but i'm trying to get uh, into bourbons and enjoy it and um so i don't have any of these sort of um kind of the words escaping me but uh, aversions to trying other whiskeys and right. enjoying them right so i totally agree so in the wine world you know if you're going to become a certified sommelier advanced so forth um, while you can specialize, like I'm, so I'm a French wine scholar, so that means I have a, a, a more in-depth um, understanding of France than I do probably of, of maybe even California or Italy or Spain or Germany and so forth. Um, but as a certified sommelier, I got to be very, 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 very 
broad as well. And I'm always into exploring and trying new things. And with wine, you know, a, a wine by itself, you might not like it so much, but if you had it with local food or the style of cuisine from that region, you go, oh, wow, this works really, really, really well. But there are some people who get, and I have friends like this, they're just into burgundy, 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 burgundy. And the, and same with whiskeys is bourbon, just bourbon, 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 or just peated, 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 peated. Um, it's, it's really trying to encourage people, explore. It's an exploration. You may not like them all, but try some of them all. And one of the most recent vi videos that I really enjoyed of yours, in fact, I was just watching earlier today and commented on it, and, and then I'm on the hunt for it. So I just did two whiskeys from Lark Distillery from uh, Tasmania. That were just I, I, saw, I saw I saw your uh, the, the video from a couple days ago. Those were phenomenal. They're fantastic. But you did a video uh, of a whiskey from Italy from yeah. uh, Suda Troll uh, out of the Alto Adige region, which is uh, on the northern border. Yeah. Um, and so now I'm super curious because I want to find one because I haven't had any from uh, it, Italy. But I thought it was really cool that you got to get side outside of the box what is typically tried and venture out and try something really, really new like that. Yeah, we kind of sort of um, happened to, me and some other friends um, in Toronto, um, happened upon a, like this whiskey on a, on, a, on a website and we're just like, they say send it to me because I'm Italian and they're like, oh Vito, look, there's an Italian whiskey. And to me, it was like an immediate buy. One, because it's Italian, but uh, two, it's two of my favorite things. Uh, uh, it's It's, aged in Marsala wine casks. That's This is the Puni Alba. Uh, it's aged for um, three years in, in, in uh, Marsala casks and then a couple of months in Isla barrels. Oh. Right, so you get, you, get, you get that sweetness from the, from the fortified wine and uh, the influence. Um, and it's weird because it's, it's only from the casks, so, but you still get a weird peatiness from it. Right. Well, uh, but a really heavy briny, um, briny note as well. So the, the way it interplays is extremely, uh, is extremely interesting, and it's a it's a very small distillery, still super young. Uh, but it was one of those things where it's like, well, it's I'm gonna try it. I I should. There's no reason why I shouldn't. And um, I have another one that I I purchased from them. Um, that is a new American oak, um, aged, um, that I'm really interested in. The the young the younger distilleries seem to be more uh, flexible and adventurous when it comes to stuff like this, right? And um, you know all the mic micro distilleries and whatever. So if you have anything local, that, and I just discovered there's a lot of local, uh, really you know fresh local distilleries in my area that I'm going to start checking out a little bit just because they're those are the guys that are going to kind of push the barrier and really you know test things out and it makes for extremely interesting experiences uh, the whole the whole way through. So it, it, in in a sense, in terms of the philosophy of making the whiskey, it reminds me a little bit of Amroot, Amroot Fusion. Amroot is using peated barley from from Isla, and then they're, or Scotland at least. I don't think they get specific as to where it's coming from out of Scotland. And then they're using, I think it's about 30%, and then the rest is coming from uh, India. So that sort of one foot in Scotland, one foot in um, uh, India, and the same thing with this Italian whiskey i know we're, we're drinking we're drinking ugadol we're talking to tiny whiskeys but yeah. got one foot in one foot in isla one foot in scotland and one foot in italy and sort of doing a fusion between that it's a, uh, even though it's not taken from the barley taken from the barrels um it's pretty interesting yeah it's um it's definitely one of my one of my one of my new favorite uh, distilleries uh it's just a little hard to get their stuff just because the italian liquor laws seem to be pretty strict but there's a, there's, there's, a, there's ways of getting it. So we're going to keep that just between us. <laughs> so there's two other gentlemen um, that are seen on cast strength. It's not just the veto channel. So who are the other two people on there? Um, Cause I've one of them. I, if I recall correctly, he was on, I think is this, I'm a, I'm a school. Is his name John? Uh, Josh. Josh. Yeah. You know what? My little brother's named Josh. I should have remembered that. Okay. <laughs> so, um, and was he on with Aquavite? He was. He was on Aquavite's live stream. When was that? A week and a bit ago, just okay. before New Year's, if I'm not mistaken. Right. So, for yeah. so let me tell me, talk to a little bit about. So, is the cash strength a three person um, 
channel and talk to me a little bit about the other guys. I know they're not here to defend themselves if you should, you know, should talk smack about them, but <laughs> I, 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 about the other guys and how you guys worked this out, got together to do this YouTube channel. So we we all kind of found each other through the, um, the Facebook wi uh, Whiskey Tribe uh, page. And it was mainly, I found out that jo uh, Brad um, lives very close. Well, not a very, I say very close. He's a four hour drive from me. He lives in Ottawa. I'm in Toronto. Uh, I have family in Ottawa. So I kind of reached out to him. He's like, hey, you know, I'm in Ottawa every now and then. How would you, you know, feel about getting together and having a drink? And this was after a couple of in um, interactions on, the, on, like, on Facebook. He's like, yeah, man, come on. we'll hang out. We'll have a couple of drams, you know, get to know each other. So me and him uh, became well acquainted, and um, Brad had um, is is fairly prominent in the whole whiskey tribe community and the lore behind uh, a couple of the videos and um, whatnot. And so I met Josh through Brad because Br Josh lives in Austin, where the whiskey vault is, and they became acquainted. So I kind of met I met Josh through Brad. And we kind of just all hit it off at once. And over the summer, um, all three of us to uh, meet in person in Austin when we were there for the uh, Crowded Barrel opening. And from there, we were kind of already sort of trying to figure out if we wanted to do a channel. We, there was a, a lot of talking about it. And there was probably about four or five iterations in our brains of what we want to do how we want to do it and then finally in october we were just like we were already because we were because we're in different cities we were already hanging out on google hangouts i was like you know what let's just start doing this let's just do the hangout once a week and people can kind of come in and talk and see what what we're all about and then we sort of from there uh kind of started coming up with ideas of what we wanted to do I've been the reason why I'm probably more um, uh, more prevalent in people's idea of the cast strength right now is because I've been pumping videos out like a madman. Right. Josh and Brad are kind of fine tuning a lot of stuff. Um, I, for better or for worse, I do I I, I learn a lot um, faster and better by doing it. So um, if you watch my first video and watch my latest video, there's a, there's a lot of um, a lot of change that's happened throughout the, you know, the last 10 or 13 videos that I've released. Um, but, uh, we're, we're all sort of on the same page of that. We're going to start doing, um, a bit more of a scheduled releases. Um, and all three of us, um, now that there's a lot of things falling in place for the other two guys in terms of, uh, being able to film and, uh, create some content for everybody. So I would say there are some, I would, from my observations, um, there, there's some challenges you're going to, you're going to have. Uh, so if you look at Scotch Four Dummies, these guys, I'm like, they literally live on the same street, with ex except from um, uh, Whiskey Shenanigans, formerly known as Bourbon Shenanigans, Mike. Um, so it's really easy to work together because they all live in the same neighborhood. They they used to hang out all the time anyway, and so it's easy to communicate. Uh, Drew, who's typically sitting in the back and diddling on the computer, has a lot of the technical uh, technical capabilities, so it works well. I can't imagine. I think it'd be very, very challenging. I'm in California, and if I had someone else on there, and then someone else was in another state, someone else was in another country, and to sort of get all on the same page, uh, so that there's you have a common formatting for titles, thumbnails, themes, and everything else like that. I mean, it's not impossible. I mean. We're in the 21st century, you know, the, just the fact that you and I are talking, you're in Canada and I'm here in California. I mean, the distance doesn't mean as much, but I, I just, but, it, you know, and I think you'll learn a lot more as you go and things will get better and better and improve. You still knew, knew it things. And my old videos, which used to be on my other channel that I brought over, I go back and watch my old videos and I kind of cringe, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and I'm still yeah, working. Yeah, and, and they're really, really long. Um, I, I was a slower pace, didn't have as much energy. Um, you know, I'm still working on the lighting issue, still working on that, trying to get that halo off my head, still working on the lighting stuff. So it's a work in progress, but I, I would just, you know, I would just say it, it's about the journey. 
you know, some some people like mash and drum uh -huh, uh, <laughs> didn't have the package together right out the right out the door. Uh, some the rest of us have to work on it a bit. <laughs> yeah, we're we're excited. We we know that there's a we we came into it knowing that there was going to be a lot of challenges because of um, the logistics of us being in different places. Um, we like to kind of make fun of ourselves uh, a little bit by calling ourselves professionals, even though even though we're 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 far from it. But it was kind of a thing that we that that kind of came about the last the first couple of live streams we did because we were running into all these technical difficulties and we were just like, no, no, don't worry, guys. This is a professional, a prof little bit of tongue in cheek, right? A little bit of a professional um, uh, production. There's going to be some technical issues, so uh, we're aware of it. Um, you know it's going to happen, but we're taking it in stride and we're learning as we go. And, uh, you know, we're only a couple months old, so there's only one way to go and it's up right now. So right. hopefully <laughs> <laughs> until, and I think until, until we call it quits, I think, I, I think that it's just going to continue to be fun for us. Well, look and, uh, the, community, uh, the community is awesome. And everyone, you know, you, Rob, Roy, everybody in the, in the, like the whiskey tube community has been, uh, extremely you know grateful in their support and uh their you know advice so it's 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 been a lot of fun and you know we're we're happy to kind of keep on doing this for everybody so uh, mash and drum says uh hey i messed up a lot at the beginning the beauty of editing <laughs> yeah 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 except you can't edit live streams so okay so there's you there's josh and then who's the other gentleman i think he lives in austin and um josh lives in austin brad lives in ottawa Okay, okay, okay. So now, so you mentioned the Whiskey Tribe. So um, I've joined uh, the Whiskey Tribe on Facebook, uh, which at first I was like, "Holy cow!" I'm getting notifications every 15 seconds. Yeah, um, it's, not, it's not. It's not Facebook anymore. It's literally <laughs> Whiskey Book. Yeah, it's it's um, and it and it's very very busy, but I enjoy it. And there are people, the entire gamut of uh, journey. So people are brand new. I mean, they're asking like, you know, kindergarten type questions, but it, it seems to be like a really, just a lot of fun uh, people there. People, you know, you gotta have a little thick skin, people, you know, a lot of good humor going on in there. I, I've been enjoying um, the Whiskey Vault and and then the Whiskey Tribe. I actually like the Whiskey Tribe videos better because you get a little bit more of a behind the scenes kind of look at things. Yeah, I can see that. Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting because like, like the, there are a lot, because it's because everyone's got to kind of got to remember with the whiskey um, vault channels, it's still for the nonprofit school, right? Right. So they got to keep it a little bit toned down. That the right. tribe videos are a lot more fun and interactive and um, you know um, informative for more in depth stuff. But the 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 vault channels are your you know for the most part your typical just review channel videos. A little bit of a little bit of ball busting in there, but right. Uh, I like I like the tribe channel uh, the tribe videos myself a little bit more just because uh, they're a bit longer and you know there's more information there for me at this point. Right. So I don't know if you want to talk much about the school. So um, as I mentioned before, so I first went back to college, studied enology, worked with winemakers, interned at three local wineries. Then I went through the Wine Spirit Educational Trust, which is a UK program. Um, and then went studied with three master sommeliers to become a certified sommelier. And it basically was an 18 week boot camp, three nights a week. It was like it was supposed to be three hours each night, but it's more getting close to four hours each night. So after working all day, I would then go study for three to four hours. And then the days we didn't have class, I'm studying, got had stacks of flashcards and then getting together with fellow classmates to do blind tasting on weekends. Um, and then after 18 weeks, then took the, the, the exam. Um, so I'm, I'm really, really big on education because my channels are called Eric Waite Wine Studies, Eric Waite Whiskey Studies. Yeah. So, you know, it's also about adventure and it's about exploration and there's a lot. And I like try to work in more humor, but it, it's always had a more sort of academic tone to it. So I'm really curious about the school itself. I don't know if you signed some, some sort of NDA where you can't talk about the school or can you talk a little bit about your experience and going through that? Well, well, you, you went through the I, school, right? No, I did. I didn't go through the program. Uh, Brad's gone through two levels of the um, of the whiskey sommelier training, 
and Josh is actually um, in line for the next class in the spring for the for the Somalia um, classes. Okay. Uh, my uh, the um, sort of knowledge of of the, of the schools when I was in Austin, I, I got brought through uh, the the Wizard Tower and the the floors, um, the classrooms and whatnot. I went into the vault, but um, the the school there's a lot of information about the school on their on their website. Um, everyone that I've talked to that has gone through the programming has nothing but great things to say about it and the teachers and because they pull a lot from um, the the whiskey community as well. They have a lot of um, well known authors and um, well you know like very educated people uh, to come in and teach classes and participate in the classes so that uh, people attending have uh, you know a lot of um, a lot of resources to pull from. Um, so one of the things. So I remember when the website was first up, they didn't have the faculty listed. And I was kind of like, I really didn't like that. I think schools need to have the faculty. What's the faculty's background? So now that now they have the faculty on there, people are whether they're full time or part time or guest speakers, whatever like that. Um, so now the faculty's on there. And then and I actually have talked to uh, Daniel about this. We talked for like an hour and a half offline um, cause I, and I asked him a bunch of questions about it. I went and then looked at other marketing schools and actually, cause if you look at other marketing schools, um, uh, financially they're in that same ballpark. Now it sounds insane to me. I just let you know, I spent $10,000, but it was for 18 weeks, $10,000 to go through the Somali boot camp, which is now no longer being offered here in California. Now you can only take it in New York. Right. Um, I won't tell you how many thousands of dollars I spent for all my other academia, which was insane. But the one thing I think to keep in mind is whether you're going to a university or uh, a tech school or anything else is every class is just an introduction. Uh, they introduce you to books, they introduce you to topics, they introduce to subjects. 90% of what you're gonna know and learn is gonna be from your own study. Um, and just because you went through a class with three master's malaise didn't mean you were gonna pass because uh, um, there were four people so we had 16 people in the class. There were four people who didn't pass the first time going through the certified sommelier training because they didn't put in the effort uh, yeah. on their off time to study. And they had other response. Some of them had kids and they had families, and you know, so they didn't realize mm -hmm. just how much work it was going to be. But um, so if if you take a class there, whether you go through the first, second, third, fourth, whatever, each one is only going to be an introduction because that's, that's how I feel. I feel this exact same way about about education is. Um, it's it's just the beginning because uh, there's nothing to, for me. Nothing beats real world experience. Um, you can be the smartest person in the world, like in in a classroom, but if you can't apply that or uh, be able to identify in real world situations, then what was all that education for? Right. It, right? So and that's why. So when I went when I studied uh, winemaking in college, when I went back on, I had to intern uh, with wineries to get hands on experience and. So I've got wines here, whiskeys here. I got whiskeys here. I have refrigerating units for wines here. Refrigerated unit for wine, wine units there. Over there, I got my. You can't see them; they're off camera. Uh, all my my wine books. Um, but one of the things I want to do, I've been visiting distilleries, and whether in, I went to Kentucky, I've been about six here in California. See production during, during the tour, which is good. Um, even if it, you, you sort of hear the same thing over and over and over and over again. At tour after tour after tour, they kind of say some of the same things. It really helps it ingrain it more into my head. But the one thing I want to do, I want to do with whiskey what I've already done with wine, which is get hands-on experience, what you're just talking about. Um, and there are some distilleries. I know uh, Springbank is one. You, Springbank, they actually have a one whole one week class and they sell out over a year in advance. Um, so you really got to sign up early, but you can go there for a whole week and they're going to work your ass off uh, in a distillery. But I think you not only do you learn more, you have a great appreciation for those who do it full time as well. Still there? Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I'm just cleaning my glasses. It's hard. <laughs> that sounds, I, I, you, well, I only see you when you're talking. So when it deads up and in technology, you never know when it's going to sort of uh, die off there. But yeah. I don't. But I don't have to go to Scotland to do that. You could, I could look for other opportunities here in California. Uh, let, let's see if I can find a distillery around here where I can get some hands-on experience. At least get a little bit of understanding of uh, and appreciation of 
but you know, on the scale of whether you, you know, were there, you're doing the monkey shoulder thing on the mulling floor or rolling casts around or working the spirit safe, you know, whether you, you're doing your cuts uh, yeah. and all that sort of thing. Uh, the, just the scale of it, what they're doing there in Scotland versus what I've seen here in California. And most of the stuff I've seen here in California, you could fit in your garage, you know, you know, in, in your house or something like that. Yeah. But, uh, the, the, um, the, fun, the cool, the fun thing is that, um, what what I what what the whiskey what the guys at the, um, at the whiskey vault are are doing at the at the school there is cool and I feel like there's a lot of um, I'm not too sure if other places do that you be able to that just because you've gone through courses and whatnot um, they have the school so you can go through the the you know the the um, the whole sommelier program and now that they have the uh, the distillery literally a five minute walk from the classrooms they can you can actually go and fiddle with and, and learn about you know how the stills work and mess with you know new make and right um, all of this and it, 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 at least you know you have the the the, um, the academic side and then you have the real world side kind of really close together i'm not too sure if a lot of other schools are doing stuff like that right so but by the way just a little word on the word small a so, because this was something I sort of wrestled with, and I talked to Daniel uh, uh, about this, and then, and really, the deciding issue for me was: so um, there was a movie called Psalm. If you haven't seen it, highly recommend it. There's th been three movies called Psalm: Psalm one, two, and three. The first movie on Psalm is about a group of guys who um, they're advanced sommeliers seeking to become master sommeliers, and it has the drama because you don't know if they're going to pass or not. And I, if you haven't seen it, I recommend it. Um, I'm not going to give any spoilers, but it, because you don't know if they're going to pass or not, it has that drama, which makes it really, really emotional and exciting. The second song movie is on wine itself. Uh, it's done really well. These are all directed by Jason Wise. And then the most recent one, third one, which just came out within the last few months, and now it's available on iTunes. Um, and I did a review of it on my other, on my wine channel, um, is about blind tasting. Um, and they do sort of an homage to the 1976 Judgment of Paris in which uh, in France, with French judges, uh, American wine producers beat the French in a blind company in 1976. Change, it rocked the world uh, of wine that the rest of the world goes, oh, maybe we can do that too, kind of a thing. And I think something similar is going on that with whiskey, you know, that Lark Distillery whiskey I just reviewed. Yep. And now they're, you know, these 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 upstarts out of Tasmania, you know, are getting are winning awards and beating some some scotches, you know, in some competitions. But um, so I went to the premiere of the third movie, um, and so and the end of my my review of the movie, I was able to provide a um, an interview uh, with uh, some of the people there in the movie. Anyway, so I talked to Dustin Wilson. He's a master sommelier. He's in the movie Psalm. He's one of the main guys in Psalm 3. So I was able to talk to him, and I asked him about the use of the word sommelier. And so I, I said, um, he has a wine shop uh, called Verve Wines uh, in San Francisco, and he has another one in New York. He's not paying me to say this. Uh, but we believe it. <laughs> anytime you, say, you mention someone's business, you have to make sure you're not, you're not getting paid to say that. So um, I, said, I said, so, hey, I'm going to ask you about the word sommelier. It means wine servant. And there's debates within the wine world. There are some that say once you leave the floor of a restaurant, you're no longer sommelier. And so Raj Parr, who was a sommelier for 18 years, he's now a winemaker. He doesn't. He says he he, refer, he doesn't refer to him as a as a som anymore. Although he's written two books on being a sommelier. Um, others disagree in the sommelier world. They say, look, as long as you're serving wine whether it's in a retail shop, at a winery, um, or, or in, a, in, a, in a restaurant, uh, you're, you're a sommelier. And it really comes down to there's the vocation of being a sommelier, and then there's the certification of a sommelier. So Raj Parr was never – he never took any exams. He was just by vocation, old-school sommelier. So I asked Dustin about the word sommelier – because sommeliers also do cocktails, they do spirits, they do beers. Now they do teas because tea has become so important. They got to know coffee, you know. So it's, it's all about beverage service, not just wine. So I asked him. I said, "What do you, so? What do you think about the word sommelier?" I said, "There's these guys, these people 
who are using the term sommelier to refer to someone who serves whiskey. Oops, I'm gonna some over here. And I have a book here. Um, I'm not gonna get it, but I, I haven't read it yet. Um, and it's actually a textbook they use down there. I'm gonna. Get, I think her name's Heather Green. Hold on one second. Um, I know, I know, I know okay. her. I don't know her, but I've I've heard of her. I think she teaches. I think they have her on at uh, at the Wizard Academy actually for for classes. Heather, yeah, Heather Green. So she's in New York. Uh, this is the book. Um, I haven't read it yet. I, I just I got a stack of whiskey books I'm working on. But she, if when I looked her up on the internet, she's referred to as uh, New York's first whiskey sommelier. So I asked I asked Dustin. You know, Master Molly, I said, what do you think about the term sommelier being used in terms of people who serve whiskey? He says he, says he doesn't have a problem with it. Uh, of course, he's not the voice for the court, of, the entire court of Master Sommeliers. Other might disagree, but there's disagreements within the court, even regarding the word sommelier, whether it's just people who work the floor of a restaurant or people who don't. Anyway, so he said he didn't have a problem. Once he said he didn't have a problem with it, then that was kind of it for me. It's about beverage service. Uh, and yeah, even wine sommeliers and restaurants are sometimes going to serve whiskeys. In fact, for my certified sommelier floor exam, um, so the exam is three, you have blind tasting, you have a theory, which is history, geography, rules, regulations, climate, everything to do about wine. And then third part is a third part is a service exam, which you have a mock restaurant scenario in which you have a master sommelier sitting at a table as if he's at a restaurant. And you do a champagne service and you're ask, a answering questions. You had to know like 120 different cocktails, the base spirits, be able to recommend producers um, all at the same time while doing and doing food and food and wine recommendations. Um, but one of the some of the questions I did get asked questions about whiskeys um, and, and, and I was not into whiskeys at the time. They used to include cigars, but they, they don't uh, do that anymore. But anyway, so. I, 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 so I, I, I agree with Dustin. I can, I have a more bigger, broader perspective on a sommelier, but since nobody has created a sommelier course until these guys, you know, they're breaking new grounds. There's a whiskey ambassador course in Scotland. The Edinburgh whiskey Academy has courses as well in Edinburgh. They have a two day course. Um, and so if they have people with practical and academic background, who are their staff who are training people um, and uh, to work in whiskey marketing and so on and so forth, then it's perfectly legit. And if people are willing to pay for it, and if, particularly if, if their costs are on par, and it sounds like I'm doing apologetic for the, uh, for the school. That's okay. But if, but if the, if the costs of everything else are on par with other marketing schools, which I looked and seen and they are, then I don't have a problem. With it. So I, I'm not sure if I'm going to go. Uh, I've talked to Daniel about it. Um, I might go in October. It's hard for me to plan that far in advance just because of work schedule, kind of. Right. Thing. So, um, well, if you're out there in October, um, I'm gonna be. I'm planning on being out there in October, um, around the middle of the month. And if you do end up uh, going, it would be great to kind of connect there if, if that's where, where you're gonna be. Yeah. So I'm gonna answer a couple of questions here. I don't want. I, I, this is one of the challenges of doing live streams with another guest is. You don't want to ignore the people. So Santa Cruz and asked me, how is it having two channels working out? Okay. Bummer losing all the subs from before. Great show as always. Thank you very much, uh, Santa Cruz. And so um, I'll be honest with you. It's kind of like having two wives. One of them is going to end up getting neglected. I don't spend as much time on my wine channel, I but I plan on making changes on that. Um, it's growing on its own. Um, my Psalm reviews have exploded. I have another Psalm review. It'll be on the art of the movies. Um, there's some other things that are coming out uh, in February, so I'll do another one. I just bought some a wine from Yao Ming. He's Chinese, but he bought uh, a winery in Napa Valley, so I bought some of his wines. So I'll get back into it. I want to do a lot of stuff on Burgundy. It's challenging because I really am 99% focused on whiskey studies and learning whiskeys. Uh, and I feel like I'm neglecting that. And I also run the court study group for the court of mass sommeliers. I have my own group. I was the other group. So I have more going on than what I really have time for. Um, and I need to make some cuts somewhere, but yeah, it, it's, it's challenging, but you know, I'll get to it. I don't have wife. I don't have kids, you know, Rob whiskey in the six. I've been wanting to do something with him and he's got responsibilities and duties with his wife and family stuff. So it, it can be a little challenging, but 
Um, you know, I'll, I'll work it out. Uh, <laughs> Goheb says, what about your si singing channel? Well, that'll be in with my uh, my whiskey jazzer size channel. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> be sweating with the, sweating sweating to the oldies doing uh, whiskey reviews while while dancing and <laughs> stuff. Like I've done. I don't know if you ever seen. I've done. I used to start my show with doing dancing. I've done a little dance and stuff uh, at the beginning of some of my videos. So it, it's it was I did it as a joke and then it kind of stuck. It kind of became, became known uh, as this guy. Now people ex expect it. So anyway, um, so yeah, so I know they haven't got anything planned out. They plan on doing perhaps something similar. So they had the, what was it? Was it August last year? Yeah, it was, it was in August uh, of last year, the grand opening. Right. So which I thought was a little crazy because it was like 104, deg 104 degrees. And I know, so Bart, uh, Bill, Whiskey Dick was there. Uh, Aquavite was there. And they all kept talking about how hot it was, and you couldn't drink a whole lot of whiskey because it's so hot, and haven't drink a lot of water. So hopefully, if they do it in October, it'll be a little cooler. Yeah. But the challenge is, if you do something in the summer, the kids are out of school, people can travel, you know, people who have families and stuff like that. That they little challenger in October. You know, for me, October is the beginning of the uh, uh, um, fiscal year for the federal government. So there's a lot of changes that that go on there, and that that. That change affects things, but I'm looking to go to Scotland in July, and then if my schedule isn't totally busy, enough, then I'll go down to uh, um, go down to Austin. And I get and I have friends who are Somali A's down in Austin. There's a Somali A community down there, but hopefully we get down there in in, uh, in October and perhaps meet you up down and meet you in person. Yeah, I'd, I'd, uh, I'd, like I said, I'm, I'm making plans. Uh, there's a couple of Canadians that are, that are probably going to come down there, so we're going to try and invade uh, invade Austin and and plant a flag. <laughs> Kevin Miata says Eric is like the Ellen of the whiskey tube. That's a compliment. Uh, although I'm just a little bit more lesbian than she is. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit, a, a little bit less hair too. Yeah, yeah, just a little bit, just a little <laughs> bit. So I, you know, it's funny you said it because I. <laughs> I thought about it as a joke. Say my jokes, though my humor, it's it's my own. Only one that really understands it is my brothers. As always, I thought about doing it as a joke, doing an Ellen dance off video, and I thought, nah, I might be jumping the shark on that one. That might be going a little bit too, but just as a joke. But it, it might be. Less. I've had some stuff that, for, that I thought would be really funny, in, and then I go, nah, Eric, don't do that. <laughs> don't do that. It'd go, go a little too far. But uh, anyway, yeah, it'd definitely be cool. <coughs> Excuse me, uh, to, to meet up down there. So, w is the timing of do you think of um, of that? I don't want to go ga whiskey gathering. What do they call it? Would is that coincide at the same time they have that class? Because the next class is in October too. Well, they have a spring class, and then I think they have one in October. Yeah, they have the two classes. I I'm almost positive it'll probably be either the week prior or the week after. Of, of a class it wouldn't be the same the same week that would be that'd be pretty insane so yeah because i thought about even you know taking the class um uh, you know it's a big chunk of change for four grand um i thought about it but it may be because of my prior academic background and studying and study habits the main thing i would look want to get on is actually a better understanding of the marketing side rather than production side oh but that reminds me no, i'm changing completely change subject anyway so i'm considering I'm, I'm considering it. I'll, I'll think, about, but, I'll, I'll, but it's hard for me to plan this far in advance. But Daniel said, "Hey, just let him know," and you know, uh, later on, and maybe work something out. So I, uh, it's I have a draft form. It's it's a, a, a primer of on Scotch whiskey production that I wrote. It's about sixty pages now that it has photos in it. So uh, I'm going to make it available for for free. Um, people will be able to download it uh, um, off of my because I don't have a website yet. Um, but I'm uploaded to my Facebook group, which is something I've been neglecting. But on Facebook, you can have there's a section where you can put in files. So for the court of national is I upload maps, I upload upload notes. I have extensive notes. I have like 400 pages of notes on French wine, and well, I'm gonna do the same thing uh, for this, but for whiskey. So um, obviously, it's free. My Facebook channel it, it, group is free. So if you want to keep up to date with what I'm doing, uh, just go to Eric Waite Facebook group. I usually put a link uh, down below, 
and then when I upload that, it'll be available. But I'm looking for someone who has editing capabilities who will spot my typos. Uh, so if you know anybody who's who's willing to spend some time, uh, you know, nitpicking and going through my typos, but I go into some stuff that's a little deeper than any of the textbooks I have. Um, so anyway, so hopefully that I, I'm hoping to have that out before the end of February, if not sooner. Very cool. Very cool. So what do you guys got coming up? You think what do you got plans in terms of your your channel for the next for 2019? Um, I guess still kind of build and make it our own right there's there's because there's such a saturation right and you we kind of want to um, everyone's got like their thing so we're kind of working and kind of trying to cultivate uh, a little bit of a like a mini culture around around people that you know uh, subscribe and take part in the live chats and um sort of just kind of the whole attitude in our videos and that's the thing with with three people in three different cities and three different backgrounds is that there's so much there's so many variables to consider uh and our videos will not be alike uh our opinions don't always see eye to eye um our you know one my my one of my favorite whiskeys might not be one of theirs and vice versa so we're we want to we want to just kind of continue what we're doing um brett with brad and josh starting to make a bit more a couple more videos and um, I'll have a, have it a place of, of, um, of a, of a lot of variants, right? So the, coming from different backgrounds and opinions and just an all encompassing, no frills, just come and enjoy whiskey sort of, sort of thing. So it's, it's, I feel like there's a lot of guys that have followed us already that kind of are on board with that I idea and that philosophy and just kind of continuing that, that snowballing effect that, uh, this is kind of what we want to do and how we want to cultivate, you know, um, you know, ourselves and the videos and our, the community, the, you know, the small community that we have right. um, and uh, just kind of continue on going from there. So one of the challenges is um, now that there are, there are so many whiskey channels um, is to somehow do something different than what everybody else is doing to differentiate yourself. You know, so if you go into a whiskey shop or a grocery store and you look at an aisle, you know, of let's say Chardonnay, you know, it's like a gazillion Chardonnays. It's the most ubiquitous wine in the world. Um, and it's like how, you, in terms of wanting to get someone to drink your Chardonnay, how are you going to stand out from the rest of it? You know, um, yeah. and, and in terms of viewers, um, even though you're not selling a product necessarily, how are you going to get viewers and that you're doing something different versus what everybody else is doing? Um, and so my recommendation is really figure out uh, what is your brand? What is your distinction and differentiation? What is going to be different than what everybody else is doing? Um, and get a consensus among the three of you on that. Because um, if you're going to do the same thing that everybody else is doing, I think you're going to be really, 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 really challenged. Um, and then, but be real, what you guys are really, really into. Um, for me, for example, and being super geeky, I mean, like 90% of the whiskeys I'm doing um, are not your grocery store average everyday whiskeys. And the result is nobody's Googling those, right? Um, they'll Google Corvrecken, they'll Google Ugadel, they'll Google those. But some of the other ones I'm doing, California whiskeys, nobody's searching for those. So I don't get the traffic that other people do, but on the other hand, nobody's doing the whiskeys that I'm doing. And I don't really care because it's about the whiskey, not about subscribers or whatever else. Um, but you could, if you were to just focus on bottom shelf whiskeys, which you don't want to do, uh, <laughs> your channel would explode because people want to watch it. So you kind of got to have to figure, okay, what are we all about? Who are our targeted viewers? What, what's our, our audience? And then what's the sort of presentation, the label? Um, I, I did I recently did a live show about whiskey labels um, because we first eat with our eyes. We first drink with our eyes. And so Ardbeg, uh, to bring in Ardbeg, they've been masters at, at making themselves different and stand out from their neighbors. You know, they're right next door to the Freud and, and Nagavolen. Um, and yet those three, when I visited those three distilleries, they are so radically different not only in terms of the experience of visiting the distillery, 
and I, and someone who's new to these tasting them might think they all taste the same, but they're so different in their styles of whiskeys and their approach. Lafroy doesn't even peat their whiskey, peat their barley, and, and have peated whiskeys. Their, their approach to even how the peat gets into the whiskey is radically different than what our, how Ardbeg does it, hence their different character and profile. But I would say that's one of the things I would, would say is kind of figure out, okay, what are we about? Um, and then what sort of the brand you want to do of what you're going to do and who you try to reach and what you try to accomplish and then just make sure you have fun while you're doing it. Yeah, that's, that's, that's essentially what we're, what we, uh, what we're doing. Just enjoying, enjoying it. Um, and you know, learning, that's the biggest thing is like, it's still, it's still learning. And even when we're trying different, like, you know, whiskeys that we've had and we're talking about it on camera, it's still learning because a whiskey can change day to day. Right. So it's, uh, it's, 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 it's still going to be fun. It's one of the things I really like that the fact that you did that Italian whiskey that nobody else. Uh, Rob Whiskey and Six did it as well. Yeah, um, we, me, and, me and Rob had a had a cool conversation about uh, the the distillery when I uh, after we went um, bare when we had um, our, his live stream, and uh, we're both extremely excited about uh, about the stuff they're doing. Right. I want to so D eight Silk two. Um, he says the value of modern micro economy from YouTube is that you can micro target. True. Uh, so you'll be so you can get the most geeky and most hardcore consumers, right? Except for, and I agree with you, and if you may have heard me say this before, ninety percent of the people who are eating hamburgers and steaks don't want to know anything about the cow. They don't, they don't want to know about the grain and grass it's eating. They don't even necessarily know how it's cooked. They just want to eat a really good hamburger or a really good steak. Ninety percent of people, whether it's wines, whiskeys, beers, they just want to. They what's a good whiskey? What's a good wine? What's a good beer? Where can I get it? Um, where, how can I afford it? Um, and, and that's all they want to know. They're they're not interested in going uber geek. Now I, I can't help but be an uber geek. I, that's just what I am. Um, so I will never be anything other than uber geeky. But you're true. That's true. I will have a micro economy uh, on YouTube with a micro target, and I will have micro subscribers and a micro audience. <laughs> they, they, those things tend to go hand in hand. So if you're doing real high end, super high end wine, you know you have ten acres, you know everything berry is hand picked and hand sorted, and everything's in micro. It says ultra elite primo wine, but you're only producing a thousand cases, yeah, and but you're gonna sell them for really really expensive. Yeah, you're gonna have greater quality, smaller um, quantity, and you're gonna have a micro base. But that's just as part of the decision making process. But yeah. it's now, I'm going to respond to his next statement. He says, but that 10% can be the most hardcore. Absolutely. Totally agree with you. And they're the biggest spenders. I know, but I'm not selling anything. Uh, uh, you can monetize that. It's about how to target quicker. I totally agree with you. The thing is, I'm not selling anything right now, but I totally agree with you. Anyway, so let's talk, get back to this whiskey. <laughs> so how are you enjoying the, the Ugadol? Because um, um, we haven't really talked about the Ugadol. I'll be honest. I finished my Ugadol a while ago. <laughs> so I, I actually... I actually move. I uh, I did move on to to a bit of Octomore, um, but uh, Ugudal is one of one of, one of my favorites. And so you said the Ugudal, um, you remember it not being as uh, interesting. If I'm remembering correctly, what was I the word? Was, you used? I think it was ashier. It wasn't as complex. You know, it hadn't opened up. Now it seems sweeter. It seems silkier. It's uh, it's just more developed um than what i remembered but that's i mean that's the uh that's the glory of the experience of getting through getting through a bottle is just seeing how it develops and expands yeah so, have, have you speaking of that sorry speaking of that because i am very recently i discovered this has there been a whiskey that you've had where by the end of the bottle you you're, you've realized i've let this sit too long and it's just oh, it's over. Yeah. I, I, had it with a bourbon. I, I had it with a couple bourbons. Um, yeah, so they, they become oxidized. Um, so they get sort of in with wines, it, they develop a red wines and it gets like a rusty nail character to it. With wines, with whiskeys, it becomes flat and stale. It gets a stale yeah. to it. Um, yeah, a couple bourbons. Uh, I think I had uh, a buff bottle of Buffalo Trace. You know, it's a twenty-five dollar bourbon, so it wasn't that big of a, big of a deal. Um, and I might have done that with an Elijah Craig, uh, the, not the a barrel proof, but one of the other ones. Um, but yeah, with a couple of bourbons, I haven't yet knock on wood 
had that happen with any of my scotches yet. Um, but that, the debate of whether to, because I have a couple of those spray things, you know, I could put, you know, mm -hmm. yeah, I could spray them if I wanted to. I but I, I've watched videos on whether you should do it or not, and I, I haven't made my mind up yet. So, Josh, Josh is actually a very big, um, um, big uh, supporter of the of the spray. Um, is it rayon? No, it's Ar argon. Argon, argon. It's argon. Ray yeah, rayon is used, used to waterproof your clothing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, argon. So, um, yeah. So uh, he he he's he's fully um, a supporter of that. He uses it for he uses it for his special bottles, not okay. for his everyday bottles, but for the what bottles where. You know, it's a couple hundred dollars, and you want to save it a little bit, and you want to dip into it every couple, once a month, once every other month. Um, he, he, him, and another couple of guys that I know that use it swear by it. Uh, but everyone's got their own sort of method. Some yeah, people, I like, a couple can. Some people, a couple can. can. I should, in fact, Bart, Scott, and Bart are actually doing an experiment. They have two bottles, one with the gas, one without the gas. I don't know how long they're going to wait. Till they do the reveal, the the difference between the two, but they actually have an experiment on, on that going right now. Oh wow, cool! That's not, that's not, that's cool. So how many of the how many different Ardbeg expressions have you had? Um, I've had the ten, the Ugadal, the Korvrekin, the Anoa, um, the Alligator, the Kelpie. Okay, I haven't had the, uh, the Supernova. Oh, Supernova, cool. Uh, the Renaissance, which if you can find a bottle of the Ardbeg Renaissance, uh, definitely get because it's out, uh, it's outstanding. I've seen a bottle. It, the, the San Francisco whiskey shop has one, and, and they they're insanely expensive, insanely expensive. But they've got one. It, it, it is absolutely amazing, uh, and probably one that I'm forgetting. Yeah, I'm definitely forgetting one or two more. Okay, but uh, yeah, I've, I've, I've beg, and I'm 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 fairly close friends with uh, with two people that are um, just the biggest art big heads. So it like a lot of that influence is is strictly from them. They were all about art big, so I was like, oh, I'll give it a shot. And yeah, it, they 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 weren't wrong. It's absolutely amazing. Mm -hmm. I, I, it's one of my favorite distilleries now. So I've only had Octomore. Which which, which Octomore are you drinking now? Um, the seven point one. So I've only had a couple different Octomores, and one was at the distillery. So in my head, I don't have like a strong impression of it. How would you compare that with what we're just going on uh, with now with the Ugadol? Uh It's earthier. Um, the, like oddly, the the, the peat's earthier. It's not not as ashy. Way more sort of like a raw ish sort of bacon. That raw pork just kind of starting to sizzle kind of kind of feel octomore is it, like has always been this like weird unicorn uh in my mind of the insane uh tightrope that master distiller to peated whiskeys um it's unbelievably balanced across the board uh at least for me and if if i've tried to kind of uh, mix it in and out of some things and just kind of play around with it. And I, it always throws everything off. It's by itself is just so well balanced. That it's just, it, it stands, it stands on the top of, uh, for me, um, in terms of, um, of a, of a peated expression, just in terms of w how much peat you can put into something and it still achieve this amazing friendly balance. And yeah. friendly, friendly, very loosely, obviously, because some people can't even smell it. But um, for people that really enjoy peat, it's 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 one of those just amazingly balanced uh, expressions. So, I, but now I got to go to the store and go buy one, <laughs> which is a problem. One of my problems of watching whiskey tubers is I got ooh, I got to get that one. It's yeah, because when you're when you're super passionate about something, it, it does it does show and. When you're passionate about something as well, you, you're able to convey it a lot more freely and expressively. Right. And that that just has, that captivates a lot of people. There and are there hard. are a few bottles I bought because of Scott and Bart, so it's it's kind of their fault. Every every bottle that I that I have on my shelf is because of you know the you know for the most part whiskey tubers, right? Just whenever so whenever I hear a lot of 
especially in my, you know the first couple of months I was getting into whiskey and I was buying a lot of stuff to kind of just test the waters. It was because I heard good things from the whiskey vault, from Scott and Bart, from Roy. Um, you know, it's just like all these different ex- um, opinions, and it's such a great resource for anybody trying to get into whiskey or trying to ex- a branch out of you know their their um, their um, you know wheelhouse of what they enjoy. So I just want to acknowledge a couple other people got asked. So bourbon, I don't, I don't, I don't didn't have, I think it's bourbon insane. Uh, Bur- just, bourbon, bourbon sane, bourbon sane, or bourbon insane, or bourbon sane. So I just described to his channel. So if you guys want to check it out, uh, focusing on on bourbons, um, I think he's really. I mean, he's kind of new, but uh, in terms of his presentation, I think he's doing a really, really, really good job. So if you guys are into bourbons, uh, check his uh channel out um so i've watched maybe half of what he's got up there and i think he's doing a, a pretty good job i'm only like five percent bourbon i mean i've been to kentucky i've got a bourbon shelf here i'm about 90 percent scotch and of that 90 percent scotch i'm you know 80 percent of that is probably peated you know i'm, I'm more of a, a, a peat head but occasionally i get a sweet tooth you know and so i'll reach for a, a, a bourbon so would you would you have a preference between the Ugadol and the Octomore? Uh, oof. see, and I always run into this issue when people ask me for ask me about stuff like this because they serve different purposes for me, right? And that's one of the good things that if you're into whiskey and you have a couple of bottles on the shelf, like some days I I don't feel like having uh, a lot of sweetness. Um, so I'll go. I'll I'll skip over Ugadol or some of the sherry finish whiskeys and go for something, um, you know, uh, more on the Octomore side or, um, uh, um, what else do I have? Or like a log of Vulin, right? So like st- the stuff that's that's less sherried. Some days I'll just be like, I really want something sweet, so I may pick up a bourbon or I'll pick up a sherried whiskey. So, um, if you were to kind of just Ask me like so. I'll ask. I'll, I'll answer this. Which bottle would I buy again? That's a good question. I'll. I'll. I'll I can answer that. That's more easier for me to answer. So which one? I would. I would. I would buy the seven point one again. Okay. Okay. So yeah, I totally agree with you because wines are as similar as, um, you know, Pinot Noir, one of the most versatile. One of my favorite grapes. It's the most versatile. You can have it with steak. You can have it with. I love it with salmon, um, but sometimes. You know, I want something with some grip and some some earthiness to it and some mushroom character. So I'm going to go with, you know, a Barbaresco or a Barolo, you know, out of Piedemonte, out of, out of Italy, or something, I want something really light, something really delicate or something like that. So, and, and what mood I'm in. So like that Lark Distillery, um, particularly the cast drink I just did, that sucker's so wheat. That's the sweetest whiskey I've ever had. Insanely delicious. But yeah, you got to be. It, I find it as an after dinner whiskey, that kind of a context. That's not a sitting around, you know, reading a book, smoking a cigar kind of a whiskey. That's a, you know, I just had something that's maybe kind of heavy. I want something that satisfy my sweet tooth. Same place, maybe the same play you uh, might have with some bourbons as well. But yeah, I totally, I totally know what you mean in terms of it's the context that's going to make you enjoy uh, one over the other. So I actually have a question. I know this is where, where it's, it's, we're supposed to be talking about whiskey, but I have a wine question for you. Okay, it happens here a lot. These, I'm always venturing off into wine, so these guys, most of my, those, most people watch us are, are used to that. Go ahead. So, what is so one of my favorite wines is um, the McManus Reserve. Okay. Um, have you had it? What are your opinions on it? Uh, I I like it a lot. I was just, I'm, I'm curious now that it can't, because it, it, we've wines kind of come up a little bit and it kept, I, my mind kept on going, I need to go remember to go buy another bottle because I'm out. Um, so the but, label pops into my head, the bottle in terms of seeing it on the shelf. Um, but I don't think I've ever had it. No, no okay. I think I've had it. Yeah, yeah, I don't, honestly, I, because people have this, people seem to have this kind of, um, con- misconception that because I'm Italian, I'm like an expert in wine. <laughs> and yeah. I, I, I am not. I enjoy it. Ask me to ask. Ask me about anything remotely close to, you know, how it's made or everything. Like, no, I drink it and it's good. Uh, but I've, I've, I've kind of cultivated a little bit of a of a fanboyness uh, for the McMadness um, 
McManus um, like wine. So just kind of curious. So just following Pinot Noir, it, it, so Nebbiolo, so, yeah. So Nebbiolo uh, from Piemonte, the two DOCGs, the top regions are Barolo and Barbaresco. Um, they have a similar aromas as Pinot Noir in terms of earth and fruit, mushrooms and spice and stuff. But Nebbiolo, young Nebbiolo can take your lip and pull it up over back of your head. It's so tannic. We got a lot of grip on it. But right. they both are have that haunting and enchanting character to them. Um, though you can just sit there and just smell them and smell them and smell them. I, I really, really, really uh, love them. And I think... Um, I think Rob has actually had a whiskey that was aged in a Barolo cast, but I can't remember what it was. But anyway, get back. We'll get back into whiskeys. So, um, anyway, so we're at this about an hour and 15 minutes. Um, I like to keep it to usually about an hour, hour and a half at, at the most. Um, so I kind of want to wind things down just a little yeah. bit. And it's dinner time, so I'm getting a little bit uh, hungry here, especially on, on the whiskey. Um, but really, really um enjoying this ugu doll i'll probably finish the rest of this a a after dinner uh really enjoyed having you on uh, thank you for having me it's, it's awesome talk wish i uh, wish you guys all the best look forward to seeing what you guys are doing on the channel hopefully maybe i don't know if i'll ever get up to canada or not um but if not hopefully, maybe i'll be able to meet you down uh in austin hopefully Love it'll be ball sweat hot down there <laughs> i think like, when that when they had that event done i'm like what the hell are they thinking I, I like, love I love the heat. I was I was unfazed by it. Although I was I was extremely intoxicated. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't I didn't even feel the heat. So yeah. So uh, anyway, so um, I want to thank everyone for uh, tuning in. If you guys haven't uh, hit the thumbs up yet, please do. If you guys haven't subscribed, please do. If you guys haven't checked out Cast Strength channel, subscribe, uh, please do. I want to thank everyone for joining. Um, I've tried as much as I can to sort of interact with you guys in the chat as well as uh, with my guest Vito here. Uh, this has been absolutely fantastic. It's good to uh, get to know Vito. Uh, I want to thank everyone for uh, tuning in and hope you have a great weekend. I will be live again on Sunday. I have something called the Whiskey Church. It's a slightly different dynamic. I usually have a, I use whiskey as often as a metaphor for stuff. Um, and sometimes I'm just doing talking about whiskey, uh, but sometimes I use it as sort of, and I have a little sermon uh, in which I use something about life and whiskey. Um, because a lot of people say, you know, it's, it's not just the whiskey, it's about the people. And I've learned things about people and interacting with people, um, by our, our common engagement, uh, with whiskey. So anyhow, so, uh, cheers. Cheers. And, uh, hope everyone have a good night and it's lunch.